Uh, welcome back to the Cross Board Interview Podcast. Today's guest is author of Who's Driving the Greater and Other Governance Questions, and also president of Strategic Steps Incorporated, based out of Sherwood Park in Alberta, Ian McCormack. Ian, thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, before we start, I have one uh, simple question. Why write the book on good governance? Well, I have, I have a love for local government that's kind of evolved over the years and perhaps even the decades. I've always been interested as a, as a, as a volunteer on municipal boards and committees and then on having run for office once myself unsuccessfully and uh, seeing the efficacy that's available in local government versus party based government. I have a real, I've developed a love for local government because it seems to be people believing that they can do something to make their communities better. So that's why the topic, um, as for the book itself. Uh, people have been suggesting to me that I write a book for a while now, and one of my colleagues has collected as what she called a series of Ianisms over the years, uh, things I would often say at conferences and workshops, little one-liners. And uh, so at, at one point she had sent me that list and said, get writing. And there's a bit of a story, of course, to the, to the genesis of the book I'm happy to tell you about too, but that's how it became a book and why it's about local government. So what do you mean by that? How did the book become a book? So, okay. I said to you that I was interested in doing uh, in, in local government. I've been interested in doing some writing. I had written some articles for publications like Municipal World over the years, so shorter form things. Um, but uh, I was up in Nunavut in, the, in Rankin Inlet in the fall, in November of 2019. I was hired by the Nunavut Association of Municipalities to do an orientation for all the newly elected mayors in Nunavut. So I was up there, uh, it was a one day session, and it was fascinating too, because I got there, loaded up my slides, which I'd sent to them in advance, and the slides had all been translated into Inuktitut. So it was wow. all symbolics, and I could not read a darn thing that was on my slide. So thank goodness I brought a hard copy in English, and it was done with simultaneous translation. So it was speaking and listening was a little bit slower than it would ordinarily have been just because of translation, but it was a fascinating experience. I tag teamed that with the uh, the outgoing mayor of Callaway, a woman by the name of Madeline Redfern, who has she hasn't been on your show. You should uh, should look her up. I certainly. Uh, anyway, will. okay. Uh, so I was I had done this orientation for the mayors, and during that day the blizzard blew in, and Rankin Inlet on the northwest coast of Hudson's Bay is inaccessible by road. Uh, it's accessible by water during summertime, so there was really no way in, no way out if you were flying. And the blizzard shut down the flights and it ended up shutting down the flights for five days so that's where the joke about overnighting in rankin for five days is so it was funny so day two i ventured out to the airport just to see if if the airplane was coming in it didn't that you could actually hear it passing overhead as it was doing it was going from a callow to Yellowknife. um and i phoned the hotel back and i said can i have my room back kind of sheepishly and they said well if, if you're not leaving nobody's coming in so it's here it's, it's here until the flights start again they obviously knew more about Rankin than i did so that was uh, that's how the the book started i think i pounded out twelve thousand words or something to that effect in the first couple of days just not a lot else to do in a blizzard in Rankin inlet and i i've had the pleasure to read the book and you you give a lot of good details about how good government governance should work Mm -hmm. Who did you talk to? Like you must have been talking to through your business strategic steps, municipalities across Canada about how they're doing it right and how they're doing it wrong. Because while everything should be working in a perfect world, sometimes it doesn't. So where did you get the details from? Because you, you mentioned that you did run for council, you were the unsuccessful candidate, but um, did you talk to municipal leaders here in Alberta across none of it, across Ontario, across Saskatchewan? Mostly, yeah, yes. Uh, I hadn't spoken them, however, with the idea of writing a book. I, again, having this passion for local governance done well, there are things that I would see as I was interacting with a, a mayor or a council or a CAO somewhere that seemed like a really neat idea, something done really well that was an adaptation to local circumstance. Or on the flip side, sometimes we were brought in because things weren't going well. So we had to do some organizational diagnosis uh, and try and get them back on the right track. So through both of those, in a bit of a maybe an organic fashion, I learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. And there's a concept in the book that's called wise practice. 
it was a colleague of mine who had who'd come up with this term. Maybe she didn't. I don't know, but she was the first one who told me about it. And what it talks about is a, a best practice in one area in a, being adapted to another area. So, for example, what's a best practice in the city of Calgary doesn't necessarily work in three hills, even though the principle may hold you can adapt the best practice to become a wise practice to use it locally. So I picked up quite a lot of that as we went through the, uh, the process. I work primarily in Western Canada. I'd say 80% of the work that we do is in Alberta and Saskatchewan. The rest of it is either Northern Canada, NWT and Nunavut, uh, either West or East of the prairies. And then sometimes I work in the States. I haven't had an opportunity to speak at several conferences. And it's always on the intersection between elected officials and senior managers. So on topics like ethics or codes of conduct uh, or uh, something we call tone at the top, which is how chief administrative officers, city, county managers can help build or can help destroy a culture in an organization as well. So all of those deal with that interaction between the elected officials and senior managers. And so that's where I heard stories from people. And I must tell you too, that as I was writing the book, uh, one of the early drafts had a lot more named a lot more names uh, because these a lot of these situations I was using real life examples for and when I sent it to a friend and colleague a fellow by the name of George Cuff to review he advised me to not necessarily tone it down a bit but remove the names and places he said the point still stands even if the individual isn't named and that that seemed like a really smart thing from him to me something he had learned and that I eventually learned from him so people may see themselves in this or municipalities may, may read about themselves in the book. It might be them, but it also might not because it's very rare that we, we run into a completely unique situation anymore. One of the areas that you touch on early on in the book is, uh, and you mentioned it a little bit in the uh, brief introduction here, political parties and municipal levels. You, you're happy that it's not, that they aren't as prominent. You are seeing the rise of quote unquote slate candidates now here in Calgary. And the reason I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show is because we are in the midst and this will be airing the second week of this uh, season three is the midst of a Calgary city council series for two and a half months of sitting down with candidates. Mm -hmm. um, this, the rise of political parties and the rise of political ideology has spilled over to municipal politics. I don't care if you're here in Calgary, if you're up in Three Hills, if you're up in Fort McMurray or in wherever. M provincial politics and federal politics is playing a ma major role in municipal politics. I, I, I think that that's easy to say. Do you think that could be a detriment to good governance going forward and potentially the downfall of potential, not downfall, but a downside of getting into municipal politics in the future? I really do think that. And that one of the reasons I had, I had lunch today with a, with a friend who's a former MP, and I told him partway through the conversations, you can keep your, your party-based politics. I'm much more interested in local because it's, you dance with the one that brung you. You are interested in your, lo in your local, historically anyway, you're interested in your locality and making it better, you have some ideas and you want to test them with the public. When you start to bring political parties into that, you bring party structure, you bring party discipline, you bring party platforms into it. So even though I run in Three Hills, if that's perhaps going to be the municipality of the day, if even though I run there, I may not be representing the best interests of that community because I'm beholden to somebody somewhere else who's coming up with bigger strategic ideas. I used to actually think that parties in local government were a good idea because Everybody right now is elected, of course, by themselves, of themselves, for themselves, has a single vote. And no, you can't, as a candidate, make any promises whatsoever with the realistic expectation of them happening, unless you can get half plus one of council to agree with you. So my thinking was, well, if we have parties and platforms and a, par a majority of the party gets elected, well, you get, you know what you get because you get the platform. But what I see happening potentially is two things. One is weak individuals could be thrust into local elected office because they they're being provided with everything they need to win and they can be again malleable to the party structure the second end is what i've just mentioned about platforms being external but if the parties represent the interests of a, another order of government well those interests are going to prevail whereas if the parties say we're like 
some of what we had seen in well in Edmonton decades ago, places like Winnipeg, Vancouver now, that they are somewhat beholden to other political parties, but sometimes they're just municipal parties as well. And so in, so, in that way, I'm, a, I'm perhaps a little skeptical about it, but less so than if we look at the Conservatives, the Liberals, the NDP, the Greens, those kind of things, or separatist parties that we're starting to see show up now. So on balance, not a fan of parties in local government. Well, you just mentioned it. Vancouver is probably the, uh, the, the biggest city that does have party politics involved in its municipal elections. Uh, I, I did some research before this interview and I was trying to figure out when they started. I couldn't find that out. But what I did find was they do have platforms. They do have that. And it seems to work for them. It seems to work, and I know you're going to disagree with me here because I see you rolling your eyes, but it does seem to work because they do not want to change it back. They don't want to go away from the party politics, whether it be yeah. because party politics for them works, but Vancouver, while it, while they're, whether it being an island right now with party politics at a municipal level, it seems to work for them. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't it work for other municipalities? Or do you believe that it's just not a good like road to even travel down well under the westminster system federally and provincially essentially we've got a we got a structure whereby you you elect a certain number of people those people elect a leader and that person becomes the leader of the entity whether it's the province the territory or the or the federal government we don't have that of course here for the most part urban anyway you directly elect your mayor in a, it's like a republican system in the states and so i think if you morph one into the other you, you might end up with a bit of a bastardized approach. It might work, but I don't think that it's, I don't think it's an ideal. I think if you're trying to fit the, the square Westminster peg into a municipal circle, it doesn't necessarily work all that well. And I, you often hear where I am or where I exist or who I represent is all I know in most cases. Uh, other than me and you and maybe a couple other people, there's not a ton of people who are day-to-day -day involved in the, the, the broad, swath of local government. So if I exist in Vancouver, parties all I've ever known, I may not speak out against it because it's the water I swim in. If you are looking externally at Vancouver or Toronto or some of those other places or anywhere in the United States, really, for that matter, you would think that those systems are okay because that's what you've seen. If, but if you look at them externally, uh, I just, no, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. And for the reasons that I, that I kind of stated, I'm not really sure if that answers your question. No, it you does. It, it does. And I, I thank you for answering it two different ways and two different questions. So I do, <laughs> do appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I hear all the time with municipal politics, and this is, this it goes to your book because there's a line in your book that I, 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 I laughed at openly when I read it was, there's a low bar to run for office municipally. You only have to live in your city or, or town or area. Mm -hmm. When I talk to people on the street, whether it be here in Calgary, whether it be up north, whether it be back in Ontario, municipal politics is not a low bar. It's a popularity contest. It is, and I, you're laughing at it, but I think you've heard no, this analogy. Right, it is a it is a 100% popularity contest. You can have the best ideas, but in municipal politics, if your name is well known, you will probably get voted in compared to the person with the best politics, uh, best uh, policies. How do we overcome that when we're looking at good governance? Because we can have people, weak people who are well known, who are just going to go in there with their one idea, which I've seen time and time again across uh, Canada. And that leaves out the people with the good policies who could potentially move the, the city, the municipality, the town forward. How do we overcome that obstacle and raise the bar of low qualifications of becoming a municipal politician? Well, first of all, the, the low bar, there are some other things you have to do too. You have to live in your community. You have to be a citizen. You have to be over 18. You can owe X, more than X amount of money to your municipality and a few other things as well. Yeah. Um, but it is certainly a low bar. And even the number of, of uh, nominations you need to get big signatures on your nomination form typically isn't very high. I would agree with you in terms of popularity, almost as an inverse relationship between municipality size. So if you have a village of 500 people or a town of 1200 people, it could conceivably be either a popularity contest, and I'm not sure popularity is the word, but name recognition contest, um, because that person has been an incumbent since 1967. 
Hazel McCallion in the Seth saga until the last election is a great example of that. Uh, so, I mean, there's those kind of things. The name recognition certainly plays a role. If you come up to some of the larger municipalities and certainly the metropolises in Canada, the top 20 or 30 sized municipalities, I think it becomes less of a popularity, less of a name recognition, particularly among the chief elected official. So mayors in those. So if you look at a Calgary, for example, people didn't know Nahid Nenshi when he first won. He presented a slate or a suite of policies which resonated with a group of people who went out and sold it for him. And then it happened a couple more times as well. And you can have an inverse relationship too. Did then she realized that writing was on the wall and he wasn't going to win this time, so he decided not to run this time? Who's to say? I, I, you may know. I have no idea. Uh, I so don't they can't. Okay. He didn't call me before he, he announced he wasn't running. But then again, nobody called me before they announced they weren't running. So I think that you don't. Branding is a big piece too. If you look look at the pins behind you, the red and the blue, those in parties have big, powerful, colorful machines behind them uh, that present the entity and the individual, and sometimes the leader in varying way, various types of prominence. So, uh, Ralph Klein, when he ran in Alberta as premier, I think most of the peace, progressive, conservative. A riding sign said Ralph's team or Ralph's word or team Ralph or something, right? That, and then they subjugated the name of the, the person who was actually running. So that does become a little bit name recognition, even on the provincial level. So it does happen all over the place, but I, I mean, I, I'm not convinced because I haven't done any research, but I do see it. I hear about fewer people running in smaller communities. I mean, they're Different people are interested in different things. Community, a small C community means different things, right? Some people are involved in figure skating, some are involved in 4-H, and some are involved in politics. And thank goodness for the, for the differences between everybody. But the group of people who are interested enough in local government that they're willing to put their name forward and serve in an almost voluntary capacity in most communities in Canada is pretty small. So the, the fact that they would do it again after another four years, which is another issue, I think, is term length, um, is kind of impressive for better or for worse that they would, put, they would put other things on hold or maybe this is the best job they're ever going to have. One of the areas that you talk about in the book and yet again, the who's driving the greater uh, and other governance questions, which is uh, available uh, via the, uh, Ian's website, which will be linked in the show notes. I'm going to plug that book as much as I can throughout this Thank interview. You. hope that's okay. Yeah. Um, is when Politicians get elected. They are there to represent the people that they're elected to. Uh, well, the people who voted for them and the people who didn't vote for them. Right. Um, there has been an insurgent, and this is where I'm going to start disagreeing with you a little bit here, is there's been an insurgence with social media. Yep. The vocal minority will say what they want to say on social media, and politicians will assume that is the word of the people because they are not talking to the people. And mm -hmm. I have experience from this as a former communications person. Uh, I've seen where politicians have changed their mind because five people voted on a certain poll a mm -hmm. certain way. How does good governance survive in the age of social media when politicians are more worried about being elected than governing? Yeah, and I, I use the metaphor of a, a wedding versus a marriage. They're more interested in getting married. Sorry, they're more interested in the wedding day. They haven't really thought much about the marriage after the fact. So they're all about the win and not necessarily about the, the good governance. Twas ever thus, I think. Well, we have seen social media amplify those messages and give them channels and breadth they didn't used to have. It's rare that I go to a small community somewhere on the prairies that doesn't have the Senate that meets at the coffee shop on Monday afternoon. And they have probably met there for 50 years. The names, the faces have changed but they're all preaching common sense and they're all critical of whatever order of government they happen to be talking about. So what, I, what social media has done is taken that community from a, a physical sense of six or seven old guys gathered under the, in the coffee booth to six or seven million or six or 7,000 people amplifying each other's message 24 hours a day on a variety of different platforms. So right now, when I make reference to these groups in the communities we work with, I mentioned the coffee shop thing, the Senate, but I also mention rant and rave groups. Every community has a Facebook rant and rave group. 
I don't look at them because there's nothing really that's good there. Actually, that's not true. The time we do look at them is if we are getting involved in a community to find out what's going wrong. Uh, and it, a lot of that will come from that because I think you may have alluded to this. Enough people say it, it becomes self-evident truth. Uh, it's repeated um, uh, to time and time again, and it just tw it was always that way. Uh, so how do you work that in the age of social media? I think it's two things. I think there's a sa there has to be some savvy on the part of political leaders and uh, uh, managers, senior managers, to say that this is this is noise. And if you do want to understand what's really going on, there are other ways of getting something that's more statistically valid, if you like. But there is certainly pressure on people who are elected to listen to this. When we do orientations for councils, this is something we talk about. Uh, and even when we do presentations on workshops and conference sessions on things like ethics, this is something else, something that we talk about too, about how do you take into account that these com comments are valid, but they may not, they may not be the representative of most people. I say that a lot of people who are involved in or who are living in these municipalities are benignly disinterested for the most part in what happens in those municipalities. As long as their taxes are affordable, as long as there's a value proposition to them, they're not going to be happy paying them, but uh, they, are, they are going to do it. Uh, if the dogs aren't barking at night, and if the neighbor's property isn't terribly unseen, unseemly and the potholes are getting filled and the water isn't brown when it comes out of the tap, I don't really care about local government other than that. So there are those people who will get exercised about it and will spend an un, in a, inordinate amount of time fixated on it, but there are lots of people who are just happy to live where they live as well. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, engagement in municipal politics, municipal politics is the frontline politics. It is the politics that uh, residents have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter if they're yeah. dealing with City Hall or not. Yeah. But, but like you said, if the water's coming out clean, if the garbage gets picked up, if the pothole gets fixed, that's all they care about. How does a, how does a politician, how does a municipal councillor, how does a mayor, how does a reeve, deal with an apathetic voting base who doesn't care about what's happening as long as their taxes are staying down because you want to do good for your community you want to engage with your community and you talk about one engagement opportunity down in Lethbridge that you did and you have a population who doesn't want to get involved, who doesn't care. And then they'll speak up after the policies passed, after the decisions passed. So it's mm -hmm. a double-edged sword when politicians have to make good decisions, but they will ask for input, get nothing. And then, hey, <laughs> we'll get input afterwards, after the decisions made. How do you balance that as a future councillor, as a future mayor, as a future reeve? So I flippantly, I joked at one point that uh, I was going to run for office here in my own community and run for mayor. And the only thing that was going to be on my platform was I was just going to triple everybody's property taxes. That's the only thing I was going to do. And not, not expecting to get elected, but expecting to bring out, bring up some conversation. So not something I would ever do, but I think a large chunk of the onus on it is on the local government official, whether that's an elected official or an appointed official to metaphorically and physically meet people where they are. So if I never see local government in action, uh, if all I ever see of my local government is when I go to the pool or the grader that drives around, I don't really think about that as government. And you talk about local politics, I tend to move towards local government because politics is part of government, but I don't know that it's, it's, it's not, I, I don't think the two are identical anyway. Okay. But your question was, how do you get, how do you get people involved? My comment is meet people where they are. So that's that Senate group. It is newsletters. It is, um, I don't like open houses very much. Sometimes they're statutorily required, but you can see four people, so what's the point? Uh, it's meeting, it's being at the farmer's market, um, it's presenting to the Rotary Club, it's, it's not engaging with kids in grade six or whenever they learn about local government. Something I would love to see, but it's actually getting more difficult now, is take council on the road. Why can't you have a council meeting in the food court of the mall? Why can't you have a council meeting in the hockey rink? Why can't you have a council meeting in the high school gym? Now, uh, from a statute point of view, you can, but now with the technology that's required to, to broadcast meetings, it's hard to physically move these things. Another way is to in, uh, in, integrate people into the process as they work their way up. 
One of my very first engagements in local government was to sit on my local rec board, uh, which was mostly citizens and a couple of council members. But it was the first time I'd met a, a council member. I met the mayor through that, and that was a big deal. So bringing some people up through that so that there's some, there are community involvement uh, opportunities which involve a cross section of the community plus the elected officials. So I, I kind of like that, but I'm always going to recognize that there are those people for whom local government or any order of government, they don't care about except during elections, maybe. And then when there's a fire or a flood, they, they think about it. So it, it, it's part of it's cultural too. And there have been a lot of people who have said, you know, I can't take my people, my, my kids to the House of Commons or the, the class to the legislature assembly, legislative assembly to watch question period because of the way those guys behave. So if the cultural change is required or requested, there needs to be change that happens. And I think the onus on the initial change is with those people who seek elected office. We've been doing a series of council candidate workshops around the province over the last few months, engaging with local municipalities or chambers of commerce or both, and putting on a workshop for those who are just wanting to kick the tires before nomination day, before they've spent a bunch of money on brochures and signs, so that they can figure out if this is a job they really want. And is it the job they think it is? This is mostly about land use issues. This isn't mostly about other things which are far more fascinating. Uh, so do you really want to commit to this for four years? And if you come in with a good attitude and a good understanding of what the role is, good on you. So I, I think it's start, I think the engagement start and the onus starts with the politicians. I think it then moves to the municipal structure. And then I think the, the voters themselves also have some of it as well. Speaking about the municipal structure, uh, local government is not just local councillors because you need people driving the greater. You That's need right. people running the <coughs> facilities, running the ice rinks. Um, in the book, uh, you talk about the CAO. The role of the CAO is one of the most important roles in any local government. Mm -hmm. It is the only only, and I'm going to repeat this for the politicians who are not who are listening to me and who are not respecting this. It is the only role that is hired by the council. Plain and simple. I think you're you would agree with that, correct? Yep, yep. In Canada, you're correct. Yes. There are municipalities who love working with their CAO because they give the CAO direction. The, the CAO then gives directions to the staff, the administration. There are some municipalities, and I think if they're telling you that, hey, we only talk to our CAO, they're lying to you, they are giving direction to their administration. I can pull out a letter that I got from council to take direction from them and only them, and it probably isn't the best letter that you'd ever see, but I got it in my first year of employment. How do you work around that? How do you work around a, a council, a local government, a local council who wants to dictate what is going on in every single aspect of the town? Because there are municipal, municipal, municipal uh, politicians who want to do that, who want to fine tune what is happening. They don't want to leave it up to somebody else. They want to talk to the person directly. And you're, I mean, you're absolutely right, Chris, and something we run into all the time. In fact, that's where the title of the book came from. Uh, we had an, and it's funny, the title of the book resonates with people who understand local government. My mom wondered why the heck I called it Who's Driving the Greater. The, uh, but what ha this is about lanes and staying in lanes and understanding the roles of council, councillor, mayor, CAO, or Reeve, if you want to throw that in too, that's a slightly different beast. We often get involved in communities where there's been a breakdown to that effect, where uh, individual members of council are talking to individual members of administration below the level of the city manager, county manager, because it's a small community for the most part. And they run into each other at church and the grocery store. They're not going to say nothing. But there needs to be a culture that says, when I, as a director, an employee, hear something from council, it's not a direction to me. And, and there, there are no ramific negative ramifications for that. Two problems with that is, yeah, no, I, now you're rolling your eyes. The, the, uh, the two problems with that are, first of all, the CAO doesn't know what's happening. And the second is the individual who's being asked to do something essentially now has two bosses. They've got the CAO or somebody above them, and they've got counsel. And if those two requests were in alignment, well, no big deal. Structurally, no big deal, even if it's inappropriate. 
But what happens when those start to diverge? Which bosses, which boss do they actually listen to? Uh, the same thing can be said even for council directing uh, CAO, because it's council itself as an, org as an entity that has to provide direction. It can't be a single member of council going to the CAO afterwards and saying, hey, you know what, we need to have an extra scrape of the ice more than we, we normally do. So those sort of things need to be clear and those need to be set good and early. So we're doing a lot of council orientations and a big part of that is around council codes of conduct, uh, council CAO uh, covenants, that sort of thing. Uh, golden rule. And if those are followed, great. And if they're not, uh, they need to be visible and there needs to be uh, ramifications for not following those. We've seen that in Edmonton over the last few weeks with a member of city council who's been doing things which council, uh, which the, sorry, their integrity commissioner deems to be inappropriate. But when the vote comes to council about whether they sanction one of their own, because of the voting structure, the councillor has gotten off every time or has not been sanctioned each time. And that doesn't teach new members of council anything good. It frustrates existing members of council and probably members of staff because we, we end up with a, a cycle of responsibility that, that doesn't follow the, the cascading cycle from citizens to council to CAO and then to the staff. And that's a one-way structure too. It flows downhill, it doesn't flow back uphill again. One of the uh, big things uh, about that role of CAO is you need someone strong in that position, whether it be male, female, whoever. You need yeah. someone strong who's willing to stand up to counsel. But in the book, and this, <laughs> yet again, we went through this in the municipality that I was working with. CAOs have a rite of passage that you're going to get fired. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, they, they, they are the highest turnover probably of any job in local government. How do you talk to your CAO as strategic steps as someone who's going in counseling these people to say, you need to stand up and sometimes you have to not worry about your job because you have to do what's right for your administration. You have to do right for what is best for the community, but you also have to do right with the law, with what is legally allowed. Yep. So we start there, right? What is statutorily required of you um, and then work our way down through uh, acts through bylaws, policies, and then uh, informal ways of doing things. Our, most, all, con, all CAOs will have a contract, and that contract will have clauses in it about termination with or without cause. It will have clauses in it, hopefully, about performance measures as well, because you're looking, as a CAO, you're looking for uh, a history to be able to say whether something happened with cause or without cause. So in Alberta, anyway, there's a requirement that council does a review of a CAO every year. Now, that's not universal across the country. And if that's not happening, that's a big, big red flag. A few of us have used a bit of dark humor on this and said that the CAOs are kind of like the NHL coaches. They're hired to be fired. And a lot of it is about fit rather than skill. There's, there's many a very skilled CAO in this province who has found him or herself on the short or the sharp end of a rapier walking the plank who is really good at what they do, but doesn't fit whatever the council is, which is why it surprises me this late in a council term. So in Alberta, we're what, four or five months away from a municipal election and the potential of brand new councils in a lot of places. Why a person, would, why a council would go seeking a, a new full-time permanent CAO at this time, knowing there's so much turnover that's likely to happen after the election anyway. And that person may not be a fit, the new person may not be a fit for the for the next council. Seeing a CAO, as somebody who works with a lot of CAOs and talks to even more of them, they are, some of them are fatalistic. Like you have just said, there's a shelf life for a CAO in Alberta. Somebody, I was, I was joking with a county CAO a few years ago and I said, uh, we were talking about the shelf life and he said, yeah, probably on average about seven years. And I said, well, how far are you in? And he said, four, five fingers up. And he says, essentially saying, I expect to be on my way out soon. And sure enough, he was gone within a year. And it, 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 they gotta be a little bit fatalistic and have some dark humor about it because it's, it's going to happen. To me, a CAO who has been fired doesn't have a black mark on them at all. Unless it's happened like three, four, five times in fairly rapid succession, then there's some flags that need to be raised too. But so much more of it is about fit than it is about skill. And there's a difference too, I think, between different types of decision-making that there are, to me anyway, three types of management type decision making. You've got an, ex like a, an executive decision making, which talks about how do we put the right pieces, the right skills in the right boxes in an org chart 
to, to, to give us the best assurance of success. And that kind of disregards the human element a little bit because you're looking just at some a collection of skills. Uh, CAOs are often like that, a good ones anyway. The next level is uh, what I typically call just a management decision making, which is a manager is handed a group of resources with some skills and some personality, and they have to make the best fit happen with the resources they've got available amongst themselves. It's harder for them to move pieces in and out. And then there's that frontline decision making. Is it too wet to cut the grass today or not? So those sort of things. But to me, anyway, a CAO, a CAO is a precarious job. I have a lot of admiration for those who do it well, who keep their chin up. Um, and it, it, I'm sometimes surprised at the tough row that some of them have to hoe that they carry with such grace and don't let anybody know really about the mad paddling that's happening below the surface of the water. Uh, yeah. Again, again, I've I've covered municipal politics, uh, municipal local government in here in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, and I mm -hmm. talk to I've talked to directors, whether it be off the record or on the record, and uh, and even in my job with some municipalities, I've talked to them, and you hear from the the directors, uh, the management who's been there the longest, that they would never want the role of CAO, because they find that council doesn't respect the position mm -hmm. of the CAO. And that's why they're willing to go talk to people. And if they're willing to go talk to the directors and if the direct, if the CAO tries to stop them, they let them go. Is there an avenue where you have talked to directors, management staff, where you can, where you've said, this isn't acceptable. You can say no to the councillor because when I'm talking to city council candidates here in Calgary, mm -hmm. they say, I'm going to go do a walkabout. Yeah. The greatest, the greatest joke I've ever heard was yes, minister, where uh, his chief of staff says, where's the minister? He went for a walkabout. You can't let the minister go for a walkabout because he might learn something. <laughs> <laughs> How do we, as municipal employees, as local government employees, stand up to council when you potentially could face being fired as well and say, I can't take direction from you. Well, you, you have to because I'm the mayor, I'm the Reeve. Yeah, I, that's that tough two bosses thing. I remember reading a book once called Lincoln on Leadership. And he talked about management by walking around MBWA. So same kind of concept, concept that you're talking about. I think it's a real tough spot, particularly for smaller communities. Again, where these individuals are known personally to one another. Uh, maybe, maybe in some cases even related uh, in really small communities. So I have a lot of empathy for that. To me, again, it's really difficult to push up that the municipal staff person has a boss. Hopefully, they have some sort of whistleblower protection. Uh, they've got a council code of conduct. In fact, we're just in working with a project at the moment where a director uh, has lodged a formal complaint against a council to say that they were being treated inappropriately. I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. And council has reacted to that letter uh, because they get a, they obviously get a copy of the complaint because it's against them. Uh, so there are lessons to be learned kind of around the province. The, the province of Alberta used to do a lot of what's called municipal inspection. Uh, and other provinces do something similar too, where if something has gone poorly, council can ask for a provincial review or a group of petitioners can do the same thing and ask for review and sometimes the minister will get involved. Uh, we've done a bunch of those inspections for the minister and it's not uncommon for us to see end runs done around one or more levels of management who's driving the grader again right we have had we've had occurrences where a, a mayor or a reeve or a councillor has followed a grader driver around thinking i can do a better job than this person and even if they're not interacting there's intimidation because there's that uh, innate power imbalance between the two people so support from all levels of the organization, understanding rights, that whistleblower legislation, bylaw policy, the council code of conduct, a covenant between the council and the CAO that they understand the role of clarity that can push back on. The shortcoming in all of this, of course, is that if this isn't occupational health and safety related, and the, this is not an external organization that gets involved, council makes the final decision on all this stuff. Has there been a breach? Yes or no, council gets to decide. Should we imply a sanction? Yes or no, council gets to decide. And so there, until recently, these council codes of conduct weren't required by bylaw in Alberta. It's only been in the last few years that it's actually been required. 
So, so I think we're still finding our way through this. A lot of them look very similar and we're finding gaps in some places in some in all of these bylaws, not all of them, I shouldn't say that. And a bunch of them that are, that are copies of one another or very similar to one another, the same issues exist in all of them. Uh, culture comes back into it as well. These are fundamentally humans interacting with one another. If a group of people chose to live in a geographical proximity to one another. They didn't want to look after their business day to day, so they elected a group of citizens to look after their interests. The group, that group of citizens didn't want to look after everything day to day, so they hired a town manager or village manager. If there was nobody there, there would be no need for a council, there would be no need for a CAO or, the, or any municipal staff. So it's to me anyway, this is about represented democracy and it, it's legitimate. So I don't, I think the role of local government is legit, the way it's structured is legit, but the culture on it is, um, it's, it's becoming nasty uh, and it's becoming zero sum. And that gets back to a couple of things you talked earlier about, about the role of parties, that in order for me to win, you have to lose. Um, and it gets back to uh, social media, that it's really easy to hide behind a keyboard and have that self-evident truth if you and three of your friends happen to agree with it. And that ends up in some poor treatment of staff, not only by elected officials, but by citizens sometimes as well. Um, you, you mentioned something, and I, I, I kind of laughed when you said it, that you are running into this, the bylaw that looks like it's being copied and it's the same issue in different municipalities. As a former municipal employee, I was taught very early on in my uh, job that you you reach out to other municipalities, you take their bylaws, you just copy the name and you delete their name, put your name in, and that's all that matters. Because if you can keep it simple, if you can do it quick, that's all that matters. So I do. We did, we did a project last year for the government of the Northwest Territories because they were having that problem with their hamlets, which just don't have the expertise and capacity to do bylaws and legislative services. And they were literally taking a, a procurement bylaw or a council uh, policy or proceed, meeting procedure bylaw, changing the name on it and the dates of the meetings and signing off on it. And so they were finding some real gaps in that. So we did what I joke is a choose your own adventure for the government of Northwest Territories. We developed a template bylaw with blanks in it so that council would choose a series from a series of options to adapt the boilerplate to something that actually worked for them. And so we've done that with a couple of bylaws and I'd be really interested in continuing that process too. I, I would highly recommend that you reach out to some municipalities that I, <laughs> I could give you off the record. Um, I want to talk about chapter seven in the book, uh, okay. who's driving the greater and other governance questions, because I read this chapter and I literally thought you must have been a fly on the wall in a lot of local municipal governments. Right. Um, stop doing stupid stuff. Um, there's a running joke in some municipalities that I've worked in and some municipalities that I've covered is the 1980s happened and time stopped. Mm -hmm. Everything that was good in the 80s is still being done today. And in the book, you say you got to stop doing that because what worked in the 80s, what worked in the 60s does not work today. Are you finding that municipalities, towns, uh, rural uh, municipal districts are still looking to the past to try to fix their solutions of today? It's a generalization, of course, but I think they're still using the same rule book anyway to try and solve new problems or nuances on problems, even though the world has shifted significantly. And I, I mean, I don't think they're completely to blame either. They have had a lot of stuff downloaded onto them over the years. So they're being asked to do more and more and more. And their access to resources is really limited to property taxes, fees and charges. That's about it grants maybe so they really are stuck about how they what they can do so a lot of the time they're spending doing the stuff they have to do without spending a lot of time being particularly introspective and we see symptoms of this when we look at bylaw registers or policy manuals that haven't have policies and bylaws that really haven't been looked at like you said the 70s 80s we've seen some that go back before that and in those cases those bylaws aren't hurting anybody probably but what it is showing us is that they're not they're not looking at the other stuff either. So if, they're, if, if administration now has changed three or four times since that bylaw was written or last updated, nobody remembers it. So we're living, starting to live that unexamined life. And I, I, we're a big proponent of when we do orientations or candidate workshops, is talking about council's levers. And the council either has bylaw or policy or budget. Those are the things that they can change and that will make their community better or potentially worse, but everybody probably wants to make 
So if they're not looking at what you do right now, what you've done in the past in a way that talks to value, it's really difficult to say whether you're using the limited resources in a good way. We've been working with an organization called ResourceX out of the States who developed a process called priority-based budgeting. And it really looks at the program services, facilities, amenities that a municipality has and says, in relation to everything else that we do, how high a priority is this single piece? And then the outcome of that is budget. And councils then have a pretty good understanding of what they are supposed to do from a governance perspective as they put that into one end of the pipe along with the resources. And then seeing what comes out the other end of the pipe in terms of services, service types, service levels. Example of this is, uh, has, is one I used pretty regularly and seems to resonate. It's the adaptation of, or the emergence of pickleball throughout, saying that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, municipalities were building a ton of tennis courts. People were using them, and then gradually tennis started to fade, um, which is fine. But then they, the resurgence happened as people aged and they began to become more interested in the sport of pickleball. Some municipalities were just building a bunch of brand new pickleball courts. Other municipalities said, you know, we really should examine the services we offer. People aren't using tennis as much, so why don't we convert some tennis courts into pickleball courts, saving some money, some space, uh, all those sorts of things. So, I mean, that's an example of this. Anything a government, anything a council does is a political decision. Starting something, changing something, stopping something. Uh, it might not have much of a way of political impact or ramifications, but it's a decision because you're reallocating resources and they're limited. You can't be everything to everybody all the time right now. So that's I just, kind of where I go. Yeah. yeah, I just want to piggyback on that because you sure. mentioned something about bylaws, about 1970 bylaws, 1980s bylaws that may not be affecting anyone, but honestly doesn't have any re any use on the books. And why is it still in, uh, why it hasn't been repealed is a big thing. Yep. You, um, as a newly elected councillor, sometimes you will get a big book of uh, council, like how to do your job, the rules and responsibilities, the bylaws, all of that. In smaller municipalities, I can understand reading through bylaws, reading through some of them, trying to figure out which ones you want to learn a little bit more about. But in bigger municipalities like here in Edmund, here in Calgary, up in Edmonton, even Grand Prairie, Red Deer, they might have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. How is a councillor, a newly elected councillor, supposed to go in and say, I need to look at all the bylaws that are still on the books while trying to do their job as going forward. Because as a former employee of a municipality, I know there are bylaws that I have never read but are still in force that yeah. should not be enforced. If there's a big cleanup that needs to be done to start with. And big cities, small villages, I think they're pretty much the same. One of the, the I mean, the real, one of the real challenges is pre-digital dates, days where they can't really be searched uh, and they're not uh, indexed and archived electronically. Uh, so the, 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 the binders of bylaws that hang out in a vault someplace. My interest in council is then to understand their role. And their role is really to create the skeleton of the beast that is that municipality. Uh, and then the, the municipal staff will flesh it out, deliver services, that, that sort of thing. So I think there are, well, there are some bylaws that municipal that councils look at every year, like fees and charges or, or tax bylaws that they just, they just have to. And then there are others that you're right, you don't really have a look at. So I think it's a long weeding process for some of these places. But I still think it's worthwhile for council to have access to all the bylaws because they're the ones that passed them in the first place, usually electronically. So that binder you referenced may not be a physical binder anymore. Oh, in some cases, people just like hard copy. Um, but they should, have, they should have it. They should be looking at uh, governance bylaws or all, just governance stuff. So stay away from the, some of the other pieces. But look at HR one year from a governance perspective, look at finance another year from a governance perspective, look at the way meetings run, service levels are set, those sorts of things at a, at a high level. Ditto with policy as well. And in as much as you talked about the reams and reams of bylaws, they're 10 times that in terms of policy in some places. And the idea behind policy is just to prevent municipal administration from having to ask the same question again and again and again, to be predictable. Um. What would you say to the councillor or the mayor who wants the best for their community and is willing to change bylaws, who's willing to change policies 
based on the will of a resident. If a resident comes to a mayor and says, hey, I need this zoning change, but according to the land use bylaw, it's, it can't be zoned this way. So I need you to do an extra step for me. And I need you to do this so that way I can build my business here. And yeah. with everything the way it is right now, with the economic recovery that this province is under and the cities and municipalities are under, they are more willing to do it but it may cause extra work, extra time, more money for city administration. How do you work with municipal, uh, municipal politicians and uh, local government, uh, govern, uh, local politicians to say, maybe sometimes you, you have to say no. You don't necessarily have to say no right off of that, but you have to consider it in context of everything else. So when we talk, I mentioned priority setting. If, if whatever this thing happens to be is a high priority, it has to be on side, not only with the person who brought it forward, but with at least half of their elected colleagues as well, which then becomes the test and then political capital starts to come into it as well. So it may not just even be on its own in and of its own. It might be. I'm going to challenge uh, you on that. Well. I, uh, sorry, I'm going to challenge you on that because I have seen municipalities who, while you should be negotiation, negotiating with your fellow councillors who have a very top down heavy mayor style even though it's not their one vote, they dictate yep. what happens at council. They dictate how it's going to vote. So I've seen it in Ontario. I've seen it here in Alberta. That is the way it happens. Mm -hmm. While it's great that you can say everyone's going to get together yep. and we're going to come up with a solution, sometimes that doesn't happen. And they, the mayor says, nope, we're going to do it this way because I want it this way and I'm the mayor. Yeah, the mayor's in for a bit of an awakening. We ran into that um... We ran into that in, we did a municipal inspection in, in uh, Fort McLeod a few years ago. And we have something in Canada called the weak mayor system. And it, it just means the mayor has no more authority than any, any other member of council once council realizes that. I mean, they've got some moral suasion, if you like, as the head of the, head of the organization. But the mayor in that case saw himself as the chief executive officer rather than the chief elected official and acted as such and uh, did things like, I can't remember exactly what it was, but going beyond the bounds of what the mayor's role was. And council rebuked him and did, in fact, sanction him uh, to say that this is an inappropriate use of your authority. The mayor, that particular mayor, never did really acknowledge that what he was doing was inappropriate. He ran in the next election. He'd been sanctioned essentially for the whole term. He ran in the next election for mayor again, and I believe he got about 5% of the vote. So the as an incumbent mayor, that's quite, quite remarkable. Uh, so the, the Paul, the, his council colleagues saw that and the citizens of the municipality eventually saw that as well. So stories like that get around as well. So there are some lessons to be learned from other municipalities. There are, it's, and it's not uncommon for mayors and reeves to feel that they have more authority than they really do. And unless council is willing to push back on that, that's where the, that they have that authority. That if there's, it's like, is there really a rule if there's no penalty for con contravening it, like the council code of conduct thing in the city of Edmonton at the moment, if nobody's willing to apply sanctions to somebody, does the bylaw really exist? Uh, Do you have a better answer? Do you have another answer? I'd be interested in your take on it. I, I have seen good mayors and I've seen bad mayors. Mm -hmm. I have worked with good mayors and I've worked with bad mayors. Um, in your book, you talk about openness, transparency. Yeah. You talk about uh, closed door sessions of council meeting. And technically, only closed door council sessions should be for three things, land, legal, and HR. I, 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 I believe that's the municipal governing act is if you want to talk about a discussion that has to be an, uh, an approved item, it hits those three items. Some mayors will use that as a cloak. Yes. to get around being open, to be get around having council, uh, having people at meetings, having the council meetings broadcast. I would love to say that all municipalities work the same way, but they don't. And I'm not going to paint a broad brush stroke here, but the municipal, the mayors that I've dealt with have been very on the edge of breaking ethics guidelines and breaking the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. They don't want, they want to be transparent. They want to be open. They want to have everyone kumbaya, but they're the first ones who will say, Hey, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it this way because I've decided because I've been here since X date and you're just a newly elected counselor, get in line. 
And I've heard of these conversations before where you get in line or next election, you won't be elected. So I would love to say councillors will come out and challenge, but when there are voting blocks on municipal politi- uh, municipal uh, local governance, they will stay steadfast with their respected leader. And anyone who tries to rock the boat will be surely turfed. Yeah. Just the principle at play, you, you referenced then to in-camera closed sessions, the principle at play to me anyway, the word transparency is one that's thrown around a lot. It means, a lot, it means different things to different people. And it's often a value that shows up. If we're doing strategic planning for a municipality, transparency is often one of the values that emerges. It means we try and define it because it means different things to different people. But to me, the principle is, as a local government, do we, keep, do we make everything public unless there's a reason we can't? Or do we do everything in secret unless we actually have to release it? And to me, the former is about transparency and the second is about expediency, if you like. There's not a lot of slings and arrows to things that happen in camera behind closed doors just because people don't hear about it. Uh, so, and your, and your comment too about land labor, we just say land labor legal, is uh, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And some recent changes have mandated that the, uh, the exception to disclosure under freedom of information legislation actually has to be listed on the uh, agenda topic and only agenda topics that are on the agenda before you move into closed session can actually be discussed. We have run across problems quite regularly with in camera things that are supposed to be in camera not being in camera, whether it's somebody slipping that metaphorical brown envelope under somebody's door whether it's somebody in the community putting two and two together and figuring out what's going on, whether it's somebody talking too loudly somewhere, people find out what they're not supposed to find out. Uh, and, in, and in camera is used inappropriately in a lot of cases. Whenever we do an investigation to any municipality, that's where we start. What's public that's not supposed to be public? And, and then we what's dig a little not deeper. public that's supposed to be public. So that's the corollary to it, of course, yeah. Um, and how do you defend some of these things that happen behind closed doors? Uh, with just council present, and then that comes back to that initial principle. And you're you're right that people will campaign on the principle of transparency, and then sometimes that flies out the window. Because I, I think the biggest one is around the budget. Some municipalities okay. will have open budget discussions, like there's no tomorrow, unless it is that legal labor or land. Yeah. Some municipalities will go in the closed door session on a Saturday and Sunday when no journalists are around, when no one's available to go into a meeting and hammer out the entire budget and then come out of session and say, hey, here's the budget. Congratulations, it's passed. Which technically, if it's a if it's a decision and you're making decisions based on the budget, you have to have it open to the public. If council's meeting and they're making decisions, it has to be open to the public. I, I, I read it in the MGA. I think a lot, you've read it in the MGA, but I find municipalities are skirting the issue and they are getting away with it because people just don't a care because that whole, going back to that Senate, the yep. Senate meets and they only want to talk about the dog park and they stepped in poo that one day or hey this, uh, my, my driveway wasn't plowed or there was a windrow in my driveway. Yep. So how do you get people involved to say, you know what, enough's enough. We need to be more transparent with what is actually going on. And you can't be hiding behind the cloak of secrecy with the in-camera sessions. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I, as more, more municipalities are broadcasting audio or video, I think that's pulling back the cloak a little bit. There is mystic, there's mysticism with council meetings. All of a sudden council disappears behind closed doors or the camera turns off and what the heck are they talking about? And how come they didn't tell us the meeting was over? So there's not a great understanding of the, the use of, uh, of in-camera sessions. So the mysticism has to come back. That's one of the reasons we've been doing some of these pre-council, pre, uh, pre-election sessions to hope, is to hopefully reduce some of that mysticism. But then we talked about engagement earlier too. And if the Paul, if you want to use budget as an example, I, I made the reference to priority-based budgeting earlier. And if the public is involved in setting the budget, they start to buy into the community outcome as well, because all budget really is, is a fiscal manifestation of priorities. You put your money into things that are important. So if it's, whether it's budget or whether it's bylaws, uh, some things you have, zoning, for example, you have to have a statutory public hearing and for most part too. So uh, helping people understand, I remember going into grade six classrooms and talking to them about local government. I remember even now it's an election year, so people are doing it. 
uh, candidates are going into classrooms and talking about local government. The onus, I think, remains on the people who are in local government for the right reasons, those who want to be public servants rather than self-servants, those who have grown up through the committee structure of a municipality or have been on boards of directors for charities and community organizations who just want to continue this, this community, community service to another level versus those who just want to be the boss and tell me what to do, be the big person in, in town. Which ones do you want to have a, do you want, do you want to have on your council? So to me, anyway, when it gets to some of these principles, it takes a while to change the culture. And the, the elected officials, I think, are the primary ones, and they have to want to do it. And in as much as we see communities that don't work, most of the several hundred communities in Alberta do. They quietly go about their business, delivering services and programs to the people who live there. People gripe once a year about having to pay their taxes, and the snow doesn't get picked up quite fast enough. But they're doing what they ought to be doing. There are some high profile, noisy cases, big municipalities that that I think overshadow that. It's 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 like your your metaphor earlier about the noise that comes out of social media. We hear a lot of noise about what's not going well. Those who are doing a pretty good job, we don't see them blowing their horns. I often ask a council, how do you celebrate success? That you're used to getting beaten over the over the head with a stick when something doesn't go right. How do you celebrate what does go right? And usually there's not much to talk about. It's just not something that there's an expectation that this is public money, for example. It's supposed to be used appropriately in that, that fashion. And when we do things right, that's just an expectation. If we do things wrong, then it's news. I'm just going to pause it there for a second. Sorry. The... <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we're almost done here anyway. All right. I think we're done here. Okay. Um... <clears throat> okay. My last, my last set of questions is about the book. Okay. Um, you've written the book. Uh, I have talking to some municipal councillors, especially up in Vegreville, who recommend this book highly and said it was going to be a great read. Miss uh, Tineen okay. Ruddick. <laughs> um, she says, hello, by the way. Thank you. Where can people find the book? Where can people get the book? And would you recommend it to anyone who's thinking about getting into politics? Yeah, in actual fact, this has been a bit of an, a door opener for me. Uh, I've got a re I've received calls from all over the place from out of the blue. I don't think I even have contact information in it, but people have reached out and said, can I just talk to you a little bit about what the job's really like? I'm, I'm having a conversation this tomorrow, actually, with a candidate, a local candidate who's interested in running, but wasn't going to because she thought she had to be better educated to do it. And I wrote in the book that we want councils to reflect the breadth and depth of our communities. There's no certificate that you get that says that you're, you can run for office. And I say that the only difference between those people and me is they get more votes than I did because they put their name on a ballot. There's nothing inherently different about us. So it's good. I think it's good reading for people who want to run for office. Um, it's good reading, I think, for those who are in office and looking for ideas from someplace else or to realize that they're not in, the, not in that boat by themselves, that others are actually doing the same sort of thing. Another one, I'm actually uh, meeting, I had a conversation with uh, a mayor, the mayor of Stratford, Ontario, a while ago, who's engaged me on contract to work through the book, essentially as a professional development book club for council. So we're gonna go through a couple of chapters, two or three chapters a month uh, over the course of six, or six months or so. I'll start off with a good governance workshop and then they'll pick a couple of chapters they wanna talk to. And each chapter ends with a couple of what do I call health checkup questions just for, for, for reflection. So we're going to do that for a while. So even as ongoing professional development, uh, I don't claim this is the gospel. I say it's kind of the gospel according to Ian and my interpretation of it. So I don't say that what's in it is infallible. I, there have been people who've, who've called or written and challenged some of the things in there. And that's been great. I've really enjoyed that. Because as much as I've seen a lot of things happen, I haven't been on the front lines like a lot of other people. You'd also asked about where you can get it from. So it's available in a couple of places. It's available on Municipal World's website, uh, municipalworld.ca, I think. I'll and link it you in can the get show notes. Oh, and the show notes, thank you. And it's also available through my own uh, company website, strategicsteps.ca. And either one of those places you can get it. Um, Ian, I want to thank you so much because after I read this, I had uh, an interview with uh, Mayor Olcanda here in Calgary, and I changed the way that I was asking questions based on the book. And the responses that I got were a lot more interesting than I thought I was going to. So okay. I do appreciate that you wrote the book, that it's an amazing book, and you uh, 
gave time to local governance because I don't think that topic is discussed a lot as much as it should be. Okay. I've actually started on a second book too. Now I'm, I'm uh, thinking about the, the 25 aptitudes of well-functioning mayors. And uh, so I've written these aptitudes down and I'm at the stage now of testing them. So I have talked to a few mayors that I know, current and former mayors. Actually, I have a conversation with the mayor of Regina next week on this topic. Uh, run some things by her. She's brand new, actually. I don't know if you've talked to her. Uh, Sandra Masters, I think is her name. And yeah, she, she, she was just elected last fall, right? She was elected last fall, and I don't think she'd ever been elected to, to before. So uh, I'm really interested in her take on it as well, as six months into the job whether what I've written in terms of what I see as well-functioning mayors reflects her early experience. Oh, we look forward to that as well. Ian, I want to thank you so much thank for you. doing this. Greatly appreciate it. To my listeners, like I said, Ian's book, Who's Driving the Greater and Other Governance Questions, uh, to buy the book will be in the show notes. I highly recommend you pick it up. And if you're a candidate counselor, I would, or even a mayor who's listening to this across uh, Canada or even around the world, reach out to Ian. His, the links to strategic steps will also be in the show notes as well. Ian, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks very much, Chris. Appreciate it.